Hello, I'm Pastor Thomas Wilder of the Bethel Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As we prepare to study God's Word, there is always so much in God's Word that He wants to share with us. So now get your pad, your pencils, your iPads, whatever it is you take notes with. Let's get into God's Word. talk a little bit more. So 2 Kings chapter 3, uh, we'll begin at verse number 1, and uh, then we'll move on forward, and uh, I'll go down probably to, to around verse 15. Actually, I may read a bit further than that, but we'll, we'll see. Let's pray, and then we'll just jump right into it. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for this time, and we will not rush through it. We will not just uh, run through it casually or haphazardly. We want to focus on your word because no word of God is void of power. And so tonight as we study your word, open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our understanding that we might see, that we might hear, that we might understand what your word is saying to us. And then show us, Father, how to apply it, that it may make the difference that it was sent to make in our lives. For your honor and for your glory and your praise, but it's for our good we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 3, and uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1. I am probably going to read down to uh, verse number 20. It's a very healthy portion of Scripture, but I, I need to incorporate all of that in order for us to get the whole picture, uh, just because some of you may not be as familiar with it as you once were. So we'll go back and we'll, we'll talk about it as we read it. Let's, let's start. 2 Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria 18 years of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with wool. And it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out to Samaria at the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab have rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as I, thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched the compass of seven days' journey. And there was no water for the host, for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Jehoshaphat said, Is it not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said to him, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Shaphar, Shaphat excuse me, which put water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look towards thee, nor see thee. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, and that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. 
and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites into the, your, your hand, and ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fill every good tree, and shall stop all wells of water, and mow all good pieces of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. Okay, now, got a lot going on here, but primarily what we're dealing with is the provision of the water. And it's, it's interesting as we look at this to see the dynamics of the three kings that came together. Let's, let's back up a little bit, verses 1, 2, and 3, and let's get some background. So God here, it seems, was personally observing what Jehoram uh, was doing and, and his wrongdoing. Uh, the Bible does say the Lord sees what man does. So, so God was watching. Uh, God reacted and records his evil deeds. And he, he sent and he spoke by the mouth of Elisha as he began to talk to him. So not only did God see, God recorded. And, and though all of his sins of evil, uh, the ones that separated him were the ones where he sinned against the law of God, the, the, the divine laws of God. So though all sin is evil, and will separate from God, there does appear that there are degrees of sin uh, as exemplified by the law. Now, before you cut the TV off, let me explain. Let's go back to the Old Testament. When you look at the law, the broad statement is all sin is evil in the sight of God. All sin will separate you from God. When it comes, listen very carefully to me now, when it comes to righteousness and holiness before God, all sin is equal. None of the sin. You can't say, well, I didn't kill anybody, but I lusted in my heart for somebody. Or I, or I was mad with them without a cause. Or I didn't rape anybody, but I lusted for them in my heart. I didn't take vengeance on somebody, but I hated them all the days of their life. Now, when it comes to righteousness before God, all of that's wrong, all of that's evil, all of that will separate you from God. But let's notice the law, that when God was dealing with the law, there were some sins that were punishable by death. There were other sins that were punishable by uh, being uh, put out, excommunication. There were other sins where God said, okay, if you did this, Let's say if you laid with a woman and you were out in the country, uh, the Bible assumes that the woman cried out, there was nobody here. So it says you had to marry her and you could never divorce her. But uh, let's say the, the law, and, and we'll look at this in just a minute. I pay wait, let's just look at it now. Let's look at the book of Numbers, chapter 35. And I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm, I'm going to read just a portion of it. Numbers, chapter 35. And I want to read just a few verses here, Numbers 35. And, and what I want to do is just help you to understand that when it comes to God dealing with sin on earth in terms of man against man, not man against God, because all wrong, all unrighteousness is sin in the sight of God. But when it comes to man judging other men, or dealing with sins that are on the earth. Let's talk about this. All right, let's begin at verse number 9. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, say, spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee hither, thither, uh, which killeth any person, he is my word, at unawares. And they shall be under you cities of refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And these cities, and of these cities, ye shall give six. All right, let's, let's move on down. Um, let's go down to... Because about how you kill them, 
Uh, all right, let's go down to verse 24. Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood, according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he was fled. And he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he has fled, and the avenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of, of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. All right, let me, let me, let me just sort of bring everything up so we can get into Second Kings. So what God is saying here is that if somebody kills someone, they didn't in, intend on killing them, but maybe they were hiding in a bush, and this person was out hunting, and instead of waiting to see what was in the bush, this person just saw the bush rattling and, or, or moving. And he thought it may have been a bear, or he may have thought it was a lion. And, and because he was afraid, he didn't want to take any chances. So maybe he took an arrow and shot into the bush, but then later on found it was a man there and not an animal, not a bear. Uh, he was innocent. He did not premeditate. And so this person was to go to the city of refuge, until he could stand trial. When he stood trial, if he could prove this was not premeditated murder, he was to go back to the city of refuge. He was to live until the high priest died, and then when the high priest died, then he could come out. But if they proved that it was premeditated murder, then he was to be dealt with. Maybe he was to die himself uh, or, or some other severe punishment. So what God is doing, both people had to do with murder. One was premeditated, the other was accidental. And so in accidental death, though the person is still dead that was killed, there was mercy. So, so when I say then, all unrighteousness is sin, I do mean that. It separates us from God in terms of, of righteousness. But when God was dealing with the law on earth, he gave an opportunity for those who did not do anything in a premeditated manner to have a refuge, to have a break. If a person committed adultery, we talked about that a few minutes ago, and they're in the field, uh, the, the Bible assumes that the woman cried out because she was molested by this person. That person then had to marry her and could not ever divorce her. But if she was in the city and she cried out and somebody heard, then uh, the man was killed. But if she did not cry out and they were in a city, they would assume that it was consensual and perhaps both of them would die. So there were different laws governing different sin. Now, one more time, just to make sure you don't cut me off and you don't say, well, he's speaking blasphemy or heresy or whatever else you might accuse me of. All sin is sin in the sight of God. But when it comes to judgment upon earth, God did allow for there to be cases where people were not dealt with in the severest manner. And so when we go back then to 2 Kings chapter 3, we see Jehoram here committed a sin. It did not kill him, did not allow him to die, but he was severely rebuked. The fourth thing as we introduce this text, God observes whether our repentance is partial or complete. It would seem that Jehoram put away the images, but he did not destroy them. And a few years later, Baal worship was restored. Now, the Bible tells us at the very beginning, uh, go back to 2 Kings, it said that he did evil, but he didn't do like his mama and like his daddy. He did evil in the sight of God. God did not cut him off. But he did evil in the sight of God. Let's look then at verse number three. And he wrought, verse two, excuse me, he wrought evil in the sight of God, but not like his father and like his mother. For he, Jehoram, put away the image of Baal that his father had made. He put it away, did not destroy it. Maybe he put them all in the closet, or maybe he put them all in the storage bin. And then when the people began to get in tough situations, they begin to go back and unpack all that stuff. 
It's like people putting away their Ouija boards or putting away their seance cards or putting away their tarot cards or, or whatever else they may put up. They put it in a closet. They say, I'm going to serve God, but we're going to put these in a the closet. What God wants us to do and what God commands us to do is put it away from you. Destroy it. Remember in the book of Acts, those that were dealing with curious arts, when the gospel was preached, they came, they made a bonfire, they burned them. And the point that I really want to make before we go any further is that you cannot play with sin. You have to destroy it. It's going to try to destroy you, so you need to destroy it. You cannot play with it. You cannot allow it to just hang around and lurk around because it will lurk around and it will try to do whatever it can to get into your life, to get back into your life. That's why we were talking in, uh, in an earlier Bible study I did for noonday, and the point we made is that uh, in Psalm 19, it says, Lord, deliver me from secret faults. Keep me back from presumptuous sins. And then Psalm 19, that, I mean, Psalm 19, verse 14, I believe it is, that all of us know, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Don't allow, don't let me keep in my heart presumptuous or secret sin. Because if you keep those secret sins long enough, James tells, James tells us, when lust hath conceived, it will bring forth sin. Same when it's finished, bring forth death. If the lust is in your heart, you'll have an opportunity to express it. Satan will try his best to put you in a position where that secret sin, that secret lust, that secret desire has a chance to manifest itself. That's why you don't want it in your heart. That's why you pray to God, Lord, keep me from secret sin, from secret faults. Let them not have dominion over me. Keep me back from presumptuous sin. So it seems that Jehoram put away these gods, but later on brought them back. Now, the sad thing, the next thing we want to bring about is that, that God does indeed understand the continuance of sin. Jehoram put him away, he brought him back. The same thing is recorded in the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar repented initially when Daniel said, you've had a dream, and God showed you in this dream that you're going to be cut down, and you're going to be put out like an ass uh, eating, uh, eating grass. But he says... It, it, if you'll repent, if you will give something to the poor, if you, let's look at it. Daniel chapter 4. I know I'm doing a long introduction, but I am going to get there. Daniel chapter 4. I want to look around verse 27. Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. Turn very quickly there. Let's take a glance at that. This is Daniel's advice to, him, to King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 27. It says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be the lengthening of of thy tranquility or of thy peace. If you'll do these things, Daniel said, listen to my counsel, Daniel says, if you'll put off these sins, then God will lengthen your days. Nebuchadnezzar did do right for a little while, but the Bible says it came to pass after so long a time, he's walking on, on, through his garden or he's walking somewhere in his kingdom, and he says, look at all of this that I have made. Man, I did this by myself. I did it with the work of my hands. And God, God said, he heard a voice at that point, to no, know tonight's the night. Tonight's the night, okay? And, and his, his, his uh, mentality changed. He ended up out with a mental disease and a mental illness, rather, and he ate grass like a cow. Okay, so let's go back then. So, so we've introduced now Moab, we've introduced Jehoram, and so the Moabites then were idolaters. They're coming against Jehoram. Jehoram, again, put away the enemies, uh, put away the images of Baal, but probably it was a political move. Uh, Elisha 
tells him in verse 13 and 14, when he comes to Elisha for information from God, Elisha despises him. And he says to Jehoram in his face, were it not for the fact that I reverence and I respect Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you. In fact, he says, I would not look towards you, and I wouldn't even see you. You may be standing there, but I look all over you because you have nothing. You, you are nothing in my sight because of the evil that you have done. So, so if you want an answer from a God, go to the prophets of Baal. Go to the prophets of your mother and your daddy. Uh, but Elisha did uh, come back a little bit and, and sort of reeled it back in. So the thought was that the external reformation that was done by Jehoram was designed to pave the way to get in good with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is a God-fearing man, but he also vacillates. He goes back and forth. So now, let's look at verse number 7 of 2 Kings chapter 3. Verse number 7, And he went and sent unto Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab have rebelled against me. This is a Jehoram. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. Now, I'm not sure why he would make this covenant with Jehoram. Jehoshaphat, though, is willing to unite with Jehoram uh, in this expedition. He had been severely rebuked on an early occasion for having joint affinity with Ahab as we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 1 and 3. But, but now he is coming back and he's vacillating again. So let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 18. And we want to look at verses 1 through 3. So this is God rebuking him uh, earlier for his covenant with Ahab. Ahab is dead now. This is Jehoram, somebody who's doing the same kind of thing as Ahab. But Jehoshaphat goes with him again. Second Chronicles chapter 18. I want to look at verses 1, 2, and 3. Second Chronicles 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. Second Chronicles, not Corinthians, Chronicles 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. Hopefully you're there by now. Let's take a look at this. Now, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. And after several years, he went down to Ahab, to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go up with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he said, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in war. Now, this was not something that God wanted him to do to get into an affinity, you get into a relationship with Ahab. But it seemed that Jehoshaphat was so willing uh, to have peace, and, and, and this, is, this is one of those things that we have to watch, that there's sometimes we're so willing to make peace that we compromise what God has called us to do and what God has called us to be. And it's a scary thing. It is an absolute scary thing to be so anxious or to be so in love with somebody or some system or some people that we compromise what God has told us to do. If we look at 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Jehoram is quite willing for the king of Judah to take the lead uh, and that he made his plans without seeking God. This is Jehoshaphat. And so the course that he took was obviously meant uh, to secure the aid of the Edomites, but he was going so far into the wilderness that they met a desert place where there was no water. Thus, these three kings are out there. They, they, they have their formal wear out there. They have their 
people, they have their armies, but they have no water. And so when we get to uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, verses uh, 13 and 14, we see Elisha entering the situation. Uh, in the situation, Jehoshaphat, who is still man of God, he's man of God, he's, he's a vacillating man of God, but he is a man of God. So he came, uh, where he was summoned, or, or they went to him, rather, and, and the first thing Elisha says, let's look at verse 13. What have I to do with thee? In other words, we have, we have no business together. And then he makes this statement to uh, Jehoram. Get thee to the prophets of thy father Ahab and the prophets of thy mother Jezebel. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So, so there's this thought that God had brought them together and that God was going to allow them to go into the hands of Moab. Moab. Verse 14, Elijah's, Elisha's response. And, and technically, I know, you know, that there's other words, other ways to pronounce the word Elisha. I, I just do it. Uh, probably the, the closest. Uh, and most correct pronunciation is Elisha, uh, meaning uh, the L part of his name, meaning God, and then uh, Elisha. But anyway, Elisha, okay? Um, so Elisha says in verse 14, as, and, and, and this is serious, he is swearing by God here, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand. So, so this dude is pretty serious. As I stand before God, he's saying, as, as God Almighty lives, the only reason I'm talking to y'all is that I have some respect for Jehoshaphat. That's the only reason I'm talking to you, Three Kings, because I have respect for Jehoshaphat. Were it not for Jehoshaphat being in the midst of you, I would not look towards thee nor would I see thee. I have such disdain, I have such disrespect for you that were it not for Jehoshaphat, I would not even look at you. I would not even give you the time of day. I would not regard you. I would not even think of you. I, I would not, I mean, you get, you get, you get the, <laughs> the, uh, you get the gist of what I'm saying. All right, so verse 15 makes a turn. Now, I, I, I want to talk about this because I think this, this is critical here. We see a man of God, a prophet of God, get very perturbed. He is so perturbed, and it vexes his spirit to such a degree that it appears that he cannot get a word from God right now. I mean, he, he is vexed. He is hot. He does not like the people who have come out. He has no respect for the king, uh, at least two of the kings. And, and so he's at a point now where his spirit is vexed. But when his spirit gets vexed, then the problem is he can't hear from God. Now, that's a problem. That is a problem. I have one, one uh, other verse I need to look at before I, I start my commentary on this. Let, let's look at 1 Kings, excuse me, 1 Chronicles, chapter 25, verse number 3. 1 Chronicles 25, verse 3. Not, not, Corinth, not Corinthians. 1 Chronicles 25, verse number 3. So we see the man of God here, uh, and, and he is upset. He's upset because of what has happened. But let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 25. We want to look at verse number 3. And it reads, Of Jedathan, the son of Jed the sons of Jedatha, Jedaliah and Zerah and Jeshiah and Hashabiah and Methan. 
Mattathias, Thia, six under the hands of their own father, Jeduthun, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise. Now, I read all those names and I went through all that because at the end of that, it says, there was a man of God who prophesied, and he prophesied with a harp. In other words, it was this harp, it was this musical instrument that, that sort of purified the air and allowed or welcomed or created an atmosphere in which the Spirit of God spoke to him. Now, this is what's going on with Elisha. He's at a point where his spirit has been provoked. He, he has just come out very hard against these people, and he's come out to tell them, were it not for the fact that I respect Jehoshaphat, wouldn't even look at you, wouldn't even look at you. But he said, call for a minstrel. Now, I, I want to talk about this because I, wanna, I want you to know how important it is, particularly as a man or woman of God or as a person of God, that when you are vexed, when your spirit is grieved, when your spirit is perplexed, when your spirit is saddened, when your spirit is depressed, it is important that you know how to get out of that. Now, let me show you a scripture, and uh, I want us to look at the book of Jude. The book of Jude. Jude is just one chapter long, and it comes right before the book of Revelation. And I want us to look up Jude. And there's one verse that I just want, to, want us to look at. Jude, I won't say chapter 1, but, um, but Jude. I want us to look at verse 20. Okay, Jude 20. I'll give you a minute to look there. If, if you're having a problem... Go just to Revelation and back up one verse, I mean one, one book, and you'll find Jude. This is what Jude writes. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, why did I want that verse? I wanted that verse because I think it's important that each of us know how to build up ourselves. There are all kinds of things, and there are all sorts of people in this life that will study to know how to tear you down. We need to study ourselves also to know how to build ourselves up. Elisha knew Elisha knew his own spirit. He knew that music for him built him up. And for most of us, music, the right kind of music, sets the tone. Unfortunately, the wrong kind of music also sets the tone. Many of you may have heard years ago there was a popular thing that people were doing. It was called backward masking. In other words, if you took a song you played it backwards, it would give you messages that you did not hear audibly when you played the song forward, okay? It's called backward masking. And it's amazing how when you play some of these songs backwards, you hear a lot of things that you don't hear when you play the song uh, forward. So, so, so Elisha knows that a minstrel, someone to play skillfully on an instrument, moved his spirit where he could hear what God is saying. And all of us need to know how to get to that point where we can hear. All of us need to understand what, uh, what to do when that spirit of depression comes. We need to understand what to do when that, uh, when that sadness comes, what to do when we are vexed, what to do when, when we need to just hear from God. Elisha played music. Uh, 
Oddly enough, when David was dealing with King Saul and he needed to have um, a word from the Lord, uh, or actually not a word from God, when Saul needed relief from that demonic spirit that he was dealing with, that Saul would go and call for David, David would play upon his instrument, and that evil spirit would leave, that demonic spirit would leave. And so there, there is a, a poem, actually there is a saying. It says, music, uh, music cures, I think it is, the sav- or calms rather, the savage breast. And, and the idea is that music, the right kind of music comes along and it soothes. The, the right melody, the right uh, combination of, 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 of notes, it calms the savage breast. And, and so that's what's going on here with Elisha. So Elisha, after being provoked, calls for the minstrel. And when he calls for the minstrel, the Bible says in verse 15 that the hand of God moved upon him. And when the hand of God moved upon him, then Elisha, verse 16, Elisha began to get this prophetic word. Now, Everyone may not be moved that way. Some people are moved by prayer. Some people are moved by just meditation. Some people are moved by just getting away. Uh, Some people like to go for walks in the country, and when they go for those walks, or maybe they just close their eyes, that the Spirit of God just begins to speak. But music is a very powerful tool, the right kind of music in the hands of God. The wrong kind of music, unfortunately, in the hand of the enemy is also a very powerful tool. People go into places where there's loud, pulsating music and all kinds of erotic dance moves come from their body. They don't intend on doing it, but the music moves them. I've used this illustration before, and I say that because I want you to know I do remember that I've used it. I remember many, many, many years ago Oprah Winfrey was interviewing Michael Jackson. And she asked him, why is it that when you dance, you start grabbing your crown? And Michael Jackson's answer was, the music makes me do it. The music moves me. And, and, and so we would have to ask ourselves then, what, what's in the music that would make us start grabbing ourselves, grabbing uh, our pubic places. What, what is it about the music? Uh, but, but music makes people do different things. And music will, can calm music. They say symphonic music is good for young babies. But it's something about the combination of notes that it helps to stimulate their brain. So when you look at all of that, you, you see why then Elisha called for the minstrel. So when he called for the minstrel, the hand of God began to be upon him. And this is the prophecy that he came out, or this is the word from the Lord that he came out with. Verse 16, he says, make the valley full of ditches. Now, why would you make a valley full of ditches if you have no water? If there's a desert place, you don't need a ditch to catch water because there's no water there. But Elisha knew that God was going to do a miracle. And when God was going to do that miracle, He was going to need places to hold this water. Now, there are two things that this water is going to do. First, this water is going to provide for their cattle. The second thing this water is going to do is going to be a reflection. And when this reflection comes, they're going to be at a place where they're going to think they see one thing, but they see something else. But let's go down. So verse 17, the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, that causes rain, neither shall you see rain, nothing falling out of the sky. Yet, God says, I'm going to do something very miraculous, and I am going to fill all of these ditches with water. Now, let me, let me just stop right here. There's so many times when God may ask you to do something in preparation for a miracle that you don't see. In preparation for a miracle that you don't see, remember the widow woman that we studied not too long ago when she came to Elisha and said, you know my servant feared the Lord, and now the creditors have come to take away my sons. 
to be bond servants. And Elisha said, go and borrow vessels. Borrow every empty vessel you can find. Don't borrow a few. Gra grab every one you can find and close the door and uh, upon yourself and your sons. What was he doing? He was preparing a heart for the miracle, was preparing her for the miracle. And there are times in your life, and there, there are other situations, where, where God does things, and he'll, he'll, he'll inspire you to do something, but you're not ready for it yet. But, but, but when you obey what he is saying, then he makes a provision. Your job is to prepare. When they were out in the wilderness or out in the desert place, and they had all the multitude of people, and they had just a few fish and a few loaves of bread, what did Jesus say? He didn't say, take what you have and just throw it and let them fight for it like animals. He said, make them sit down by companies of 50. Get organized so that you can orderly serve the people. And when they got organized, then God multiplied the food. So again, the point is, there are times in your life that God may tell you to do something in preparation for a miracle. The miracle may not be there yet, but if you obey God, the miracle will come. Your job is to obey. It may be that uh, you need a miracle, but yet you're not ready for it. You may be wanting a miracle. You're not ready for it. You want a job, but you're not preparing your speech. You're not preparing your resume. You're not getting your wardrobe together. You're not getting your transportation together. Well, how do you expect to take care of a job if you're not there? You're expecting a baby, but yet you're still not living the way you don't have a house that's big enough. You don't have a nursery. You don't have the other things. You have to prepare sometimes for a miracle. You can't wait till the miracle gets there and then go and prepare. There are times that God asks you to prepare before the miracle comes. This is one of those times. So God said to them, I want you to make ditches. And so there they are, digging ditches, no water, digging ditches, no water. And God said to, through Elisha, tomorrow, he didn't say tomorrow, I said tomorrow, but he said, make the valley full of ditches. You won't see wind, you won't see rain, but he says, verse 17, but he says, uh, but you're going to have plenty of water so that you may drink. And w if there was no ditch to catch the water that was supposed to be coming, they would not have been prepared for the miracle. There was another time, Elijah, when he had prophesied that the rain would come, uh, he, he went and told his servant, go look and see what you see in the sky. And he says, I don't see anything. He said, go look. And he went, I think, seven times. And he says, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, okay, that's all I need. Let's get up. It's time to go. So Elijah and, and, and the king ran so that they would not get caught by the water. Why was he running so? Because the water was going to come. The water was going to come. So, verse 17, going back to that, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your horses and your donkeys and anything else you got out there. I am going to make provision for all of you to drink. Verse 18, and this is the part that I love, and this is said in, in other cases. Uh, with, with Mary, it was, it says, no word of God is void of power. In other words, nothing is impossible with God. Verse 18, it says, but, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. Not only will God do this, but he is going to deliver the Moabites into your hand. So God's going to provide you with water, and God's going to deliver your enemies into your hand. And you're going to go in, you're going to smite everything that they have, you're going to, to, to just mess up stuff so they can't go back and be productive again. You're going to have everything you need. Now, I want to go look at the second part of this miracle. I said I was going to save some of it, but I have enough time to at least introduce it. Let's go down to uh, verse 20 of chapter 3 of the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 20. And it says thus, and it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. 
I don't know whether water came out of the earth. I don't know if a dam broke someplace. I don't know if the beavers stopped up something and caused water to flow downstream. I don't know how God did it. Really don't care. The, the issue is that he did do it. Verse 21. So God has done what God has promised, the very first part. Here's the second part. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings would come up to fight against them, they gathered all they were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning, and here's the second miracle beginning. And the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. Now, how did God do that? I don't know. Maybe when they were digging, they digged up some kind of chemical in the earth uh, that was red, and when the people from the elevation that they were looked down, they saw at the bottom of the, the rivers or the, or the, the uh, ditches, they saw the redness come out. Maybe they were flowers in there. Have no idea. Maybe they had bloodshot eyes. Maybe it was an optical illusion. Have no earthly idea. All I know is that God is able in his own sufficiency to make people see what they need to see. Uh, I've heard it said, I've said it before, and it is true. God has the same ability to make blind eyes see as he does seeing eyes blind. God can cause the blind to see things they've never seen before. But then again, there are people that can stand right before you trying to capture you, and God can blind you to their eyes. You can, he does. He has a way of doing it. But let me share something else with you. When it's time for you to be seen, God can make them see you. God can open up their eyes to you. There can be a thousand people in a crowd, and God can specifically draw their eyes to you. There will be something about you that will stand out. So there's no need for you to jump in front of somebody's face and do calisthenics or do jumping jacks or do anything else to try to get someone's attention. When it's time for God to open up their eyes to you, they'll see you. They'll see. You may be walking by the road. You may be eating lunch at wherever your favorite lunch counter is or lunch uh, restaurant is. You may be doing something altogether different, but God has the ability to open their eyes to see you. So the point is, serve God. Serve God. Spend your time honoring the Lord. And when you do that, when you honor God, God will open up their eyes to you. You don't have to spend all that time trying to get them. All right, so let's go on down. So verse 22, uh, the, they rose up early in the morning, and again, it may have been a reflection of the sun off of something that God knew was in the earth, may, maybe a hundred different ways that God causes miracle. But the Moabites, when they looked upon the water from the other side, they saw it like blood. They saw it as red as blood. Verse 23, they said one to another, this is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have been smitten one, uh, they have smitten one another, and now Moab to the spoil. So they knew these kings didn't ordinarily get along. One, as, as we know, Jehoram was an idolater. He did evil in the sight of God. Jehoshaphat was a man of God. So he thought maybe the unlikelihood is that these people, it's unlikely rather, that these people got together. And maybe when they did get together, a civil war broke out. And the civil war caused one to kill the other. And so the Moabites think, we don't even have to fight in this. Let's just go down and get what they left. Because out of every victory, there is spoils, both physically and spiritually. Out of every victory you go through, every victory you come to, there are spoils. The Bible says in the book of James that, but let every man is, that, that, that uh, blesses the man into temptation, but when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised him. Out of every battle, there are spoils. And so Moabite now is thinking, we don't have to fight. We don't have to deal with these three kings. All we got to do is go get the spoils. Verse 24, 
when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up because they're just walking down there haphazardly. Maybe they left their swords and their horses or whatever else somewhere else. They're just going to, to pick up the spoils. They're not going to fight. And they smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forth smiting the Moabites even into their own country. So as they go and as they fight the Moabites, they continue fighting even as they're going home. The Moabites are running home. The Israelites are running behind them to get them as they go into their own country. Verse 25, and they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land, every man a stone, and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees only in Kerhaseth, Kerhaseth, left the stones thereof. Howbeit, the slingers went about it and smote it. So just as Elisha, the man of God, had prophesied, he said, first of all, you're not going to have to do anything to get water. I'm going to provide water. But not only that, I'm going to smite the Moabites uh, for you, using you. And you're going to smite them even everything they have. And so God provides water. God does whatever he does to the Moabites' eyes so that they see things that are not, see things in, in a way that, that was intended for them to see them. They see it as blood. They come down presumptuously. They are slain. They're beaten back. They go into the cities. They only leave one city alive. And then the slingers went and took that city. All right, so let's look further. So now, we come down now to verse 26. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, it was too much, he took with him 700 men that drew swords, and he broke through unto the king of Edom, but he could not, but he could not break through. Then took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead. Here's the cruel part about idolatry. And he offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. Now, here is the king of Moab. He is a person given to idolatry. He has decided that he's going to go down. He's first of all going to conquer Israel. He tries to conquer Israel could not conquer Israel because God was fighting for them. He decides something else. Well, if I can't get Israel, I'm going to take some of my best soldiers, and I'm going to take those soldiers, and we're going to go, and we're going to fight against one of the other enemies of God. We're going to break through, and uh, we're going to break through, and I'm going to be safe. So he went and tried to break through. But he couldn't break through there either to the king of Edom. And so, as a sacrifice to his God, because uh, with, with idolatry particularly, the more you sacrifice and the greater the sacrifice, the greater the miracle. And the thing that was greatest to him at that point was his son. His son that was to reign in his stead. So he took his son, his eldest son, the one that was going to be heir to the throne. He kills him, and he sacrifices him upon the wall. And as he kills him and burns his body and sacrifices it upon the wall, his son dies. His son is dead, of course. But the people still conquer him. He is highly, highly humiliated. He goes back to his own land, and there he stays. Now, all of this came about because one man, Jehoshaphat, joined together with Elisha. And even though Jehoshaphat is in the company 
of what we might deem evil men for the sake of Israel, for the sake of his beloved, for the sake of his people. God did a miracle, even through a prophet that had been provoked. Remember, Elisha was provoked. Elisha was angry. Elisha said, we're not for the fact that I, that I regard Jehoshaphat. I wouldn't even listen to you. Wouldn't even see you. But because of Jehoshaphat, God had mercy. Now, what can we learn from this? What can we learn? Number one, we learn that the miracle was primarily for Jehoshaphat. Number one. Second thing we learn is that there are times in life that God requires you to prepare for the miracle in faith before you see the miracle. I remember the story about Steve Harvey. He kept uh, telling his mom that this was before he got rich, telling his mom that he was going to get a new car. Uh, he wanted a car. And his mom said, what do you got in the driveway? And he had an old car they had up on block. And, and so his mom kept provoking him to help him to understand this, that before you can get an, another car, you need to make room for it by getting rid of the old car that's in the driveway. So he said he got rid of the old car. And I forgot how long it said it took. I want to say it was a couple of weeks. It may have been longer. But he said not long after that, the door opened for him to get another car. Listen, as long as you're holding on to the old things, God can't bring new. And there are times in your life that God is going to require you to get rid of the old before he brings a new. Maybe you're in a relationship that you know you have no business in the world being in, but you're there because you just want somebody. You just need somebody. You want somebody on your arm, or you want somebody to call you at night. And even though you know they're lying, they'll tell you that they love you. Well, listen, the real anointed person the one whom God has sent to love you and to care for you can't get there as long as this and that is hanging on your arm. So there are times that God is going to require you, give that up, cast that on the water, throw that away, break up with that, and then I'll give you what I have for you. But as long as you're holding on to that, you can't do it. Let me show you another scripture scriptural principle that applies to that. In the old days, a person that was a beggar had garments that identified them as beggars. And so, as long as he had that garment, people could look at him and know that he was a, gar he was a beggar. Where there were times, there was one man, he was, I think it was blind Bartimaeus, that, that when he got ready to get an answer from Jesus, he threw away that beggar's garment. Why was he doing that? He was saying, what I need, I'm going to get from God, and I don't need this garment anymore. And, and so when we look at this story, I want to reiterate that there are times that God is going to ask you. God is going to ask you, do you believe me by faith? Do, ha, I've told you some things, and I've told you to get rid of this, but you're saying, God, I got to hold on to it. It's all I have. God... The, the, the five loaves and fish, that's all I have. God, I, I've been fishing all night, and I've taken in nothing. Uh, you know, th this, this person, this thing, this church, this job, whatever it is, is all that I have. Now, don't go quit your job if God hadn't told you to do that. Don't, that's foolishness. But what I'm saying to you is that there are times, like in this case, God requires obedience before the miracle comes. And so... That's the third thing we learned, that, that there are times that God requires obedience. God requires action before the miracle comes. Fourth thing we want to learn, that we need to know how to activate or, or how to create an environment in which the Spirit of God can speak to us. Elisha was provoked. Elisha was angry. And, and I may have said that. I'm, I'm not going by my notes. I'm trying to get through before my time runs out. But, but, but we need to know how to activate the Spirit of God in our lives. The, 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 the next thing we need to learn is this, uh, that God can cause your enemy to see what he needs him to see. God makes seeing eyes blind, but he makes blind eyes see. 
God can cause them to see what they need to see. And God can cause you to see what you need to see. You may go into an environment and there may be a thousand things in front of you, but God can cause you to hone in on what he needs you to see. And so as we walk with God, as we develop that relationship and that fellowship with him, then God does all these things. Listen, I'm out of time, but I am so thankful that I had this opportunity to share with you. Next week, we'll continue to talk about Elisha. We'll go into the fifth miracle of Elisha, and that is the pot of oil that is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Listen, believe, 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 believe what God says. God's word is true, and God is true to his word. I pray that tonight you have a great night of rest, and as you rest tonight, may God give you visions and dreams that are of him, even in your sleep. Here's the word that comes from Psalms. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. May God instruct you, even in your night seasons. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. All right. Listen, thank you so much for being with us tonight as we've opened up God's Word. And we pray that as we've opened up the Word, that God by His Spirit has opened up your hearts to receive what He has to say to you. Listen, everything that God says to you is good and it's for your good. So take it now and use it. Put it to work in your life and watch God make a difference. Thank you again for watching.